Well, this, this meeting is uh, going to be a uh, talk by Dr. Ian J. Cohen, Cowan, excuse me, uh, on his paper on oblique wave propagation, which was published in uh, Galilean Electrodynamics recently, but they emitted two key equations. Uh, so, but uh, uh, if you, I'm sure if you email Ian, he'll send you the correct version. Uh, and uh, this uh, talk is that uh, what is is about uh, the fact that when you talk about Michelson Morley experiment, for example, uh, you assume that uh, the angle between the, the ray of light and the supposed uh, direction that the Earth is rotating in is, is 90 degrees. It's a right angle. Uh, Ian is taking the general case where that's not true anymore. It's any oblique angle. So uh, uh, he has presented, Ian has presented his, theory, his wave theory of light before, uh, but now uh, he's concentrating on this one paper. Uh, go ahead, Ian. So this paper is, is, is on oblique wave propagation, and Denny has already described essentially what I'm doing. I'm generalizing the um, idea that if you have um, we can discuss whether whether the if is, is correct, but if um, uh, you have a, 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 an ether stream, an, an ether wind a, against motion a, a inclined at an angle of say theta to the to the to the direction of motion, uh, what what would be the relationship between the, the the speed and the speed under still conditions? Now, I'm generalizing that. Uh, so yeah, that's what I've basically said. Um, the, the wave propagation uh, is in a medium which is itself moving obliquely to the wave motion. Um, uh, and, and we're getting a general result because in the textbooks, they normally talk about uh, just moving in the direction of the ether wind or against it and at right angles to it. So we're generalizing that to, uh, uh, not, uh, to, to, to any angle uh, theta. And uh, the, the spur to this is basically <clears throat> some work which was um, undertaken by, by the respected, uh, but unfortunately now deceased uh, American physicist, J.P. Wesley, who ended up in Germany. He, he's written a number of books on, on uh, physics and, and uh, um, that's so, and uh, quite, quite detailed, challenging many of the concepts of modern physics and electrodynamics and uh, so on. But he, he worked out an equation um, that, it was actually independent of the angle uh, of obliquity, <laughs> so that there should be no difference in the time of transit uh, against any ether wind at all. And therefore that would explain the null, he called, he accepts the null result of the Michelson Morley experiment. Well, I was actually discussing this with Denny and this seemed quite counterintuitive. So this spurred me on to, to do this analysis. Uh, I just give some basic references before I get into the meat of it. Um, the, the, my first two papers really were originally published in elect, uh, uh, Galilean Electrodynamics in 2003, and then an update on that, uh, which was given at a conference in um, St. Petersburg in Russia in 2004, and it was published in Proceedings a year later. Uh, with the, I had the temerity to uh, put updates on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. So it was a, a 21st century update on maybe the, the work which had been uh, done uh, by Lorenz and Einstein a hundred years before that. Um, uh, then I did publish something uh, in Galilean Electrodynamics, which was more of a comment in 2010, which was on some other explanations of, you know, the analysis of the whole MMX experiment. Uh, and then, sorry, I'm going too quick. Uh, then, uh, then more recently in 2018, I published a paper on um, electromagnetic waves, anomaly, no analogy, uh, arguing that uh, the um, electromagnetic waves were actually not a singularity and they were quite analogous, certainly in their mathematical treatment to other forms of wave motion, like sound or, or pressure waves or wave water waves. <clears throat> I gave a, a talk to the CNPS, um, in April of, of 2018, I think it was, and it's recorded, it's up there. Franklin, who was the host? 
So in a way, the, the, the present talk today is a follow on from that. Uh, actually, it's not a problem that we only have half an hour, really, because it's a much shorter paper and it's really a follow on. And I'm just generalizing the, the wave propagation to, to any angle uh, inclined to the uh, X, X direction, if you like. So, so that's it. Um, the, 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 the first paper, by the way, I, I gave a presentation on to the then NPA. I think it was in it was in the early years as well. It's not recorded because uh, I, I think th those record recordings have been lost, but that was given uh, under the convenership of Greg Vogue. I, I think it was a, some years after 2003. It might be shortly after that. Now, uh, so what I'm doing is I'm just putting one fancy mathematical equation up here, which is really just the generalized wave equation, if you're familiar with this. But I, I have the delta by delta t plus uh, v dot nabla, which is a general um, a generalization, including the convective uh, term, where, 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 as you can see from, from, from the second term there, you have, uh, you know, like... Uh, it would be the x component, the y component, the z component, and, and you would have the cosine of the angle of obliquity would come into that. So um, it's really the, the, the dot product of, of the, the, the v and the, the operator del or nabla. Uh, so, so the direction cosines will, will come in uh, to, to any disturbance u, x, y, z, t. And um, in relationship to the spatial coordinates on the left hand side. So intuitively, you would say, if you can use the, uh, this equation, which obtains generally in fluid dynamics, uh, there is an angular dependence uh, on V because of the con convective term. So why should it be different if we're talking about uh, an electromagnetic wave, which, which I'm saying works in a sort of a, an ether uh, or a medium, uh, which is allowing these, these uh, vibrations and can be dealt with exactly the same way as fluid dynamics. Now, the, uh, the, the first electrical discharge measurement of the uh, speed of light was done by Weber and Kohlrausch, uh, you know, by the sort of light and jar type things. Uh, and it, it is found actually, it was approximately equal to the terrestrial measurements, but actually if you look in great detail at all the measurements which have taken place since these, the, the early years in the 19th century, you'll find that the electrical measurement slightly exceeds terrestrial kinematic measurements, such as those of FISO and Foucault. But actually, it doesn't really exceed the astronomical measurements, such as those undertaken by the Danish astronomer Romer and uh, the English astronomer Bradley. And I, you're probably familiar with those, so I don't need to go through them, but we, we can talk about them later if necessary. Now, the, the Michelson-Morley type experiments um, actually contrary to the orthodoxy and, and, and what's said in, in, in the textbooks and what's taught to all undergraduates, certainly was taught to me, is that the, 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 they produce um, or they provide zero difference for transit time uh, over the different inclined paths. So what's the normal narrative is that if you have, um, you know, it's almost like swimmers swimming uh, with the stream or against the stream and then swimming at right angles there too. And the, tr the return transit times of those two beams coming from the uh, source and coming directly back into the interferometer uh, show practically zero um, uh, difference. So, th so therefore you dismiss it as zero and Einstein's 1905 uh, account, it would indicate that, that, that there should be absolutely zero difference, of course. Um, but but um, that, that, that flies against this heuristic equation, as I say, uh, based on the convective term. And um, if you look at the actual original papers, which most people don't do, and you, you download them, they find, you find actually there wasn't absolutely zero difference. There was a, a difference. To use Michelson's own words, he said the difference was no more than the 1 uh, of the expected difference. Um, and and but 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 since since the um, effect is dependent upon the speed the, the speed squared of the velocity, uh, that then he would say that that the 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 speed of the Earth relative to the ether would be no more than one sixth. Now it didn't say it, it should be no more than zero, but it said one sixth of the expected value. So so perhaps there's a sort of a, an ether drag or a, a, a you know a, a sort of a locking. And we, we'll come to that. Um, 
Now, this is the standard orthogonal MMX, which Denny referred to. Uh, it's just generally given. You can see the, the light source, uh, the blue ray is going um, in, in the direction in which the interferometer is moving. I better just watch the time, actually. And if I'm over running, just shout, Denny. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, and the interferometer then has moved to the dotted line by, by the time the light ray gets there. So it's, it's gone a bit extra. And you, you have, uh, just using ordinary classical mechanics, you have the T1 is that expression there, the C minus V and C plus V, because it's going with the stream and against the stream. And then you have the orthogonal one, you use the Pythagorean theorem and you get that sort of thing. Um, if you were, my, my not, not notation is a uh, gamma is the Lorentz factor, one over square root of V squared minus v C squared. So the delta T, which is the difference uh, between the horizontal ray and the uh, vertical ray would be the, that expression there, 2L gamma squared over C, 2L gamma over C. The second term is the uh, orthogonal one. So it's different from the first term. Uh, now, I, I defined a kinematic speed, which, which is simply just the, the distance travelled, uh, which is 2L, uh, over the time. I call that CM uh, in motion. So the, the CM1 is, is C over gamma squared, and CM2 is C over gamma. Now, again, those people like Wesley and the mainstream who say that, that there's no difference would say that the CM1 equals CM2, but I, I say they're different, even for the ortho orthogonal case but let's generalize that now well l l let's put in a, a slight difficulty here first but but on the other hand every cloud has a sing uh, um, a silver lining and th this got De denny and me to a certain extent thinking about the whole situation wesley justified his mathematical calculation using vector means uh, by uh, a, a, bringing up some uh, uh, um, uh, experimental work that was gone, done by a gentleman, I've got to have a look at my notes here because I'm forgetting some of us, <clears throat> a gentleman by the name of Feist in, in Germany. It was an acoustic uh, analog of the um, MMX experiment and um, they ha he had an automobile which was like going at 60 miles an hour with on the roof um, a, 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 a generator of sound rays and then it was being echoed back and so on. Now these were the sort of curves he got. So uh, on the um, ordinate, C dash over C is basically, you know, my relationship to what, what, what I call CM. But uh, And then the V is the uh, speed in, in kilometers per hour, uh, up to 120 kilometers per hour. So this, was, this is actually the graph um, for orthogonality, for the simple uh, 90 degree, zero to 90 degree one. But he gets a great... Um, agreement uh, between, well, uh, ostensibly a great agreement between theory and, and experiment. Now, however, uh, if you consider the errors of, of uh, orders of errors of, of, of you know, ma uh, magn the magnitude of the orders of errors in this apparatus, these errors are actually not negligible. And I haven't actually given these, but FICE has a lot of uh, curves for all different angles, uh, other than zero and 90, which claim to give a similar agreement with theory and practice. So um, this seems to fly against uh, common sense and maybe uh, he hasn't taken into account sufficiently the differences here and the experimental errors because, well, what I say here in my paper, actually, if I can just get it up here quickly, I say that um, the, the, the uh, I say Feist results in addition, though apparently confirmatory are concentrated at, about maximum differences of only something like 1% in the ratio between the two speeds and the experimental uncertainties inherent in the setup need to be taken into account. So the ratio between the speed, um, you know, uh, uh, as against the speed in still conditions uh, is only, you know, maybe orders of 1% and, and uh, the, the experimental errors could be of that order as well. Now, so my analysis is simply a, 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 nothing very complex and it's a simple kinematic uh, solution. I, I have this, um, actually, I think if I, um, the, you can probably see my cursor here. I uh, had it a moment ago, there it is. Uh, so I have the interferometer here, L, and uh, the it's moving uh, in this direction. You see the, the, the V, that vector there, it's moving in this direction and uh, at, a, at an angle of theta to the ether wind. 
which could be this way. So it's moving this way. So instead of moving it in the direction, so it's moving up there. And um, what, what, what has happened is that um, the, it, I, I, delta T plus is the time for the outward uh, uh, motion, for the, for the time that has elapsed in the outward motion, delta T minus is the return. So you have a source of light, light here, which is being reflected against the mirror here, and it's coming back here for detection. So again, it's just a generalization of the normal uh, zero and 90 degree orthogonal MMX set, setup. And the, the uh, V is, is, is the, the motion uh, in, the, in the time of, of the outward motion delta T. So, um, so the resultant is, is actually C delta T plus, that's where the light ray is going. And similarly on the way back, it's C delta T minus, and that's V delta T minus. Now, if you work it out, um, it, it just by simple, you know, <laughs> sine rule and cosine rule and, and a, a little bit of algebra and quadratics and so on, there's nothing complicated, it's ele elementary mathematics. You get that the, the sum of the outward and return times is equal to that, to uh, uh, that. And I'm, I'm defining uh, a new parameter called um, gamma s, which is one minus beta squared. Beta is v over c. It's the, it's the ratio of the speed of, of whatever it is, the mo motion of the apparatus of the earth to c. Uh, so you can see that that reduces to the norm normal MMX setup. Like if theta is naught, for example, so for the horizontal business, uh, that becomes gamma s just becomes equal to gamma. Um, sorry, gamma s becomes one. So that's c over gamma squared, which I had before. And if 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 um, sorry, uh, yeah, if if theta is naught. Sorry, I'm going too quickly. If theta is naught, gamma s is naught. If if theta is ninety degrees, well then um, that 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 that. Um, this this but disappears and you find you get um just c over uh, gamma actually because that, that cancels out so it, it's a more generalized um expression for the one i i gave here down here that's all it is if you work it out so okay now let me say I'll, I'll move on um so one more thing we do is we say okay so let's get this um effective uh, a time difference, which is the di the distance, which is two l over the kinematic speed, and let's 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 find what it is at theta, and then we'll find at uh, theta plus ninety degrees plus pi over two. So, in other words, if theta is naught, you're just getting the difference between the uh, horizontal and the vertical. But at any angle theta, you're getting at the distance between a transmission at that angle theta and that angle plus. Uh, pi over two. You get that expression if you accept my expressions. I've defined a new parameter, gamma c, which is just uh, the, the cosine comes in there um, <clears throat> term. And then if you expand that out um, by the binomial theorem, you'll get that the change in phase is proportional to the change in time, which is approximately equal to that, um, omitting higher powers of, of uh, beta than beta squared. So you can see that it has a, co a signature of cosine two theta, so that the the period um, the, the period should be actually twice the the angle. Um, so so let me see. In other words, um, yeah yeah. So it, it should have um, a, a period of um, ninety degrees rather than uh, rather than a hundred. Uh, 180 degrees. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, so what we find is if if we if we uh, download um, which is available on the, on the web um, the original MMX results, they actually give these graphs. So so th this was the actual graph, uh, and this is against the um, rotation of the interferometer. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, 180 degrees and this is what their theoretical results should give uh, but but th th those theoretical results shown in um similar to mine in dotted lines are actually um i think one eighth of what the results should be if there were a complete ether drag so you can see that the actual results are very very small not zero very very small but the important thing is you can see the um 
signature of 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 the two theta you know that that, that it's actually um the period there is is is, is twice uh, twice twice the thing that, that that that's going um say north south to east west and then back again so uh so, so, so I think that's the point. It, it doesn't go down like that and up there, but it it it, it takes the whole period. Um. So um. So to con let's just conclude now. We're just we're still within time, I think. But um, conclusion. So basically, what I've done, and as I say, um, this is a very quick presentation, but it is following on from my earlier presentations, which probably we need to go into if we want to get a full picture. Uh, so I, I say that there's an ether wind, but it's very, very much diminished uh, in the Michelson world experiment type experiments. It's consistent with the dependence upon angular obliquity of motion. So in other words, if there were no angular obliquity, those lines should be just straight along the x-axis with no variation. However, I've talked about this in the other papers that the Michelson, Gale, Pearson type experiments where, where you have, um, it's something like, it, based on the Sagnac effect, where you have a spinning table uh, with, uh, you know, the light being uh, generated in different directions and coming back at the interferometer at different times. And the Michelson Gale experiment has done the same thing uh, on the Earth by um, getting the, the, the uh, local Chicago city authorities to help him set up this um, <laughs> uh, piping system of about two kilometers in perimeter in a cornfield in clearing Illinois, just outside the city boundaries. And he got this result, but they show no such diminution because they, they measure uh, very accurately the spin of the earth. Um, and uh, however, there's a very slight difference which can be um, attributed to slight solar and lunar tidal locking uh, those corrections you, you find it works out so basically you you, you can uh, analyze the um postulated ether as as um not being dragged by the earth but the earth slipping through it effectively subject to solar and lunar tidal locking corrections during the um revolution the rotation of the earth the daily diurnal rotation of the earth whereas it is approximately locked although not a hundred percent again subject to solar and lunar, lunar locking and also the gravitational field of the earth um, and the angle of obliquity depending upon where it is those two curves i showed you a moment ago by the way from the original uh, michelson morning experiment are done uh, I, I the first one is done at noon and the second one is done i think at 6 p.m um, in the evening so, um, so I, I should maybe just before I finish, I should just say something I said in the paper because um, all I'm doing is um, I, I, yeah, um, yeah, I, 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 I've said, um, I, I said it should be finally noted that we have not been concerned with the great diminution of effects observed in Michaels and Morley experiments rel relative to theoretical values, assuming the effects of a full ether wind. So that, that's where I, I have um, uh, it gone into that in much greater detail, particularly my first paper, the, the reasons for that. I'm, I'm not talking about those now, but um, uh, all we have said, uh, yeah, we have ascribed this subject to solar and lunar tidal locking to an effective ether drag through the Earth's revolutionary, but not rotational motion, which is typically less than 2% of the revolutionary speed at mid latitudes. And the analysis rather has been that given any sensible wind effect, what should be its magnitude in relation to the obliquity? So in other words, I've said uh, there is some wind effect. It is very much diminished. And uh, let's see what the effect would be if we um, take an arbitrary angle of, of inclination and, and analyze it. So it's revolutionary in a way that I'm, I'm not only um, challenging uh, uh, the the mainstream results but i'm also challenging the results of uh, the dissident phys uh, eminent dis dissident ph physicist um jp wesley in regard to this uh, th this thing and this is something that denny and i actually have have looked into in some detail so we have discussed it in some detail so perhaps i'll, I'll hand back to you denny at that stage uh, and and hope that i i haven't rushed it too much H had i an hour and a half i would have been speaking much more slowly but Harry has just asked a question about my first equation 
uh, which is the, the, the generalized wave equation. And kind of my point is, if you go, if you, I mean, in physics, there's all kinds of wave equations. I mean, you know, there's more wave equations in physics. And, and um, you know, the fact that they're using all these different waves, that, you know, there's Schrodinger's equation, there's Maxwell's equations, there's equations uh, like what you presented. So, I mean, you know, seems to me this kind of, to me, this is all very confusing. Uh, okay. Well, let's see. I, I just tried to answer that. I, I don't know what's happened. We seem to have a whiteboard now. Um, <laughs> if you have that. Get, maybe get rid of that, Danny. Yeah. Because I won't put it up. Um, I mean, <laughs> Harry's just asked a general question about, uh, I, 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 I think um, the reason for that is um, I have actually used that equation. Now, I, I, know, I know you have all these, uh, it's the div, the, the, the divergence of, of V uh, 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 and so on uh, against this, this, this NABLA operator and so on. Well, um, you, you, you're probably familiar with this, Harry, and others, in fact, that what, if, if, um, if Galilean transformations are correct, and it's very, very hard to see why they shouldn't be. You know, if you just look at, at physical objects moving at a particular um, speed relative to other ones, why shouldn't the, the speed multiplied by the time be the uh, increment or decrement of distance between the two? It, you know, why do you need all the speed of light coming? It seems nonsense. And, and, and as you know, that if you try to get Maxwell's equations, which basically, you know, are, are, are empirically... Um, justified um you, you find that you 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 cannot um transform them uh invariantly using new, newtonian um uh, sorry new, yeah new, newtonian galilean transformations for re relativistic effects yeah, but so, hertz resolved that issue yeah it, that's understand. exactly what i'm coming to hertz resolved that by my very equation <laughs> So Hertz resolved that, as you're, you're saying, you know, I'm, I'm getting it now. Hertz resolved that by introducing this uh, total derivative rather than the partial derivative, right, Harry? And, right. And, and the total derivative is basically the partial derivative plus the divergence v, v dot nabla or v dot del. So, um, so I, I actually adopt that. I use that. I, I, I generalize Maxwell's equations by putting in this capital D by DT and, and I solve them. And I, I, I get this um, <clears throat> dissipation uh, of uh, wave energy in the ether, if you like. And I, 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 so I claim that explains the... Um, uh, now, if I shift. was to be a, a traditionalist, I'd kind of say, well, wait a minute here, because all of electrical engineering and EM physics and everything uses the traditional Maxwell equations and doesn't take into account this uh, uh, additional term I assume that's in there. So, um, you know, I would sort of say, I don't really want to accept that equation because everything that we know about EM physics is based on the, uh, the Maxwell's equations that are in the books. So, Right at the get-go, I'd say I'm not paying any attention to what you're saying. Well, well, <clears throat> yeah, a bit of a devil's advocate, which is fine. Uh, I would probably answer that by saying, so be it if you wish to do that. But then you will be in the conundrum of having to adopt Lorentz transformations. I mean, if you look at, say, a, a big book like uh, Corson and Lorraine's book on electromagnetic theory, you find they, they derive all these um, force forces, um, uh, magnetic and electrostatic and so on, and, and uh, velocities uh, using classical means, and then they uh, adopted using relativity and Lorentz transformations. And the traditionalists then say that proves relativity is right, or special relativity is right, and Lorentz transformations is right. I say no, Lorentz transformations are actually a quick fix if you use the total derivative, the Hertz, Hertzian principles, you don't need to use that. You'll have a much clearer mathematics, much clearer physics, a, a much more intuitive, a much more heuristic uh, <coughs> system. If you started, uh, if you leave out that term, you say, uh, yes, my traditional electromagnetic um, experiments and theories work, but you're then um, required to introduce this terrible convoluted, 
completely uh, uh, illogical system uh, where for, for two objects moving uh, in, in relation to each other, you have to bring in the speed of light and these gamma factors and so on. And th there are really quick fixes to enable Maxwell's equations to remain invariant under transformations when you don't actually need it if you introduce these extra terms. That's how I would answer it anyway. Uh, Tom Phipps uh, has a book, Old Physics for New, uh, two it's the first and second uh, edition, and he makes that point throughout the, both of those books that you you have to use the invariant form that, that hurts you. Yeah. See, if, if I may just come back. My uh, problem, uh, is, my okay. problem is that just makes me have to go and rewrite all of the EM physics textbooks now, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> See, what I was going to say, if you forgive me, please contradict me if, if I'm taking liberties, but I was going to say, I think Harry is playing a bit of a devil's advocate. I mean, I think, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong now, but uh, I think Harry sort of agrees with us and, and, and sees our point. But he, he's, he's, he's saying, look, from the point of view of the acceptance um, of, of the generalized uh, principles which work technologically and so on, how can we convince uh, people using that, that 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 they're wrong and they need they need to use um, you know the, this model. Well, I know Ivor Cat has <laughs> raised this issue about Maxwell's equations, and um, he really criticized them, and, and that was not at all well received. I mean, they just pretty much ignored a lot of what he said, and um, you know, and I wrote put a published a paper on the CMPS about you know some of his criticisms, and what I discovered was. There's a lot of confusion in using Maxwell's equations, and they haven't really straightened it out. And, um, you know, so that's a big problem. Um, you know, first off, they don't understand what Maxwell's equations, as the textbooks present them, actually mean. And then you coming along and saying, well, now here we're going to introduce a completely different wave equation. I mean, that just throws everything into... Um, I think that's why that's going nowhere. That's that's basically what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you, you you possibly are right. It's going nowhere in the sense that that uh, its acceptance by the masses of, of academic and technological people. Yeah, but they don't even understand what they've accepted is valid. That's really pretty astounding. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, well, what do you mean bad. by that last statement? That they don't accept. Well, you know, they have this thing where all the textbooks say that the electric field creates the magnetic field and vice versa. That's oh, not right. what Maxwell's equations say, but it's in all the textbooks and it's created this confusion. Okay. And, um, you know, why don't they straighten out this confusion? They can't because they don't understand Maxwell's equations. They don't understand the mathematics. Okay. Because all they've done is, you know, just copy what, the guy, you know, before him said in his textbook, and they just copied, 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 and the net result is they don't really know what they're talking about. Well, I, I mean, I think that's probably true. Um, for my part, um, I, I do um, resile from wanting to follow uh, something which is just a mathematical statement because it looks nice and pretty and, and, and then working out some weird physical effects. I, I, I will always resile from that. But, but to me, uh, this mathematical equation, although it, it frightens some, um, is merely uh, requiring sort of a conservation of energy. It's saying, look, it, it, if you have um, uh, a system where, whereby you, you have a wave which is propagating in a medium, well, there must be some... Uh, diffusion in the system. You know, it cannot just last forever which the ordinary wave equation without this um, convective term would imply. Uh, and th 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 that's why you get this sort of um, paradox, uh, you know, and you have to introduce expanding universes and all that to, to explain the redshift. This explains the redshift. It, 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 it explains, um, it, it's used in, in, as I say, in, in all of um, fluid mechanics. You know, so, so I don't understand how these theoretical physicists who are conversant with the Navier-Stokes equations uh, don't say, well, okay, why don't I apply the same? Or why don't they say, uh, well, the Navier-Stokes equations must be incorrect and we'll introduce a very simple um, system without any 
Nablas and Dells and so on, and and we'll 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 um we'll in, we'll introduce Lorentz equations for laminar flow as well. They don't their the, the, their minds are split uh, into two. Uh, they're logical when it comes to sort of dealing with them, um, you know, the classical type physics which they're using, and then they become totally logical when when they, when it becomes a, a, a consideration of electromagnetic uh, effects. That's what I would maintain anyway. See Harry and. Uh... Ian, let me just quickly interject a, a tangent, but I think it's I think it's a relevant tangent by analogy. In the world of kinematics, um, that's built on Einstein's redefinition of the original Lorentz transformations, where velocity is relative velocity as opposed to absolute velocity, which in Lorentz's system was velocity with respect to the ether. In GPS, which is alleged to prove uh, SRT, actually the data, according to myself and the late Harry Richter, disproves special relativity and proves that the original Lorentz um, transformations where velocity is absolute velocity with respect to the ether or some other physical entity. So it seems to me there's an analogy between what you and Harry were discussing and the state of uh, the discussion in kinematics. Any comment? Uh, well, yes, I'm confused by Ian. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Harry. Go ahead. My problem that I have with what you're saying, Ian, is that the, the Lorentz transform does appear to work. And so if I was a classical physicist, I would say, well, we know the Lorentz transform works. It's been proved uh, 10,000 times, 10 billion times every day in every way, blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, I think that's a hard, hard road to, to go against. See, it, well, it, it, Harry, yeah. if, you, if you're if you using the Lorentz transformation as Einstein's transformation, it's disproved by GPS every single day to, you know, nine decimal places. I agree. If, that's, if you, because, that's because they have the wrong mathematics. But, you know, from well, their point have, of view, they have the right mathematics. And so, you know. Yeah. Well, you see, I, you know, we, we might be arguing, um, you, you know, about something that w which is not material, really, because if you gave um, a sort of a mathematician, uh, I would maintain, an exercise and you said, look, uh, suppose you um, introduce the ordinary Galilean transformation equations into what we know um, is correct experimentally in regard to electromagnetic um, induction and so on. And, and, and you, you, you found that you needed to add a correction term, X. You, add, you needed to add a correction term, X, and you know, maybe multiplicative factors and divisional factors and so on, um, to render it invariant. What would, what would you need to do? Well, if you did that exercise, you would find you'd, you'd get the Lorentz transforms. So it's, it's really, there, there are really corrections which are needed. Um, to the all ordinary sort of algebra, but I mean, if you um, if you work from first principles and, and adopt the uh, convective, uh, if you add the convective term into the wave equation, well, everything else works. Now, as I say, when you work out these um, corrections, as I say, or, or these transforms that you'd need, you will get the Lorentz transforms. That's true. And for my part, I prefer Nick to. Um, indeed to to consider them as as a sort of an absolute type correction rather than well even even if i said to you look i i, I like the reci reciprocal um, um consideration mm. it's completely logical as as dingle pointed out you know that so I, I i you know the fact that i agree with you is is to me something i i couldn't uh, be otherwise i i must agree with you it, it's so obvious uh, james <clears throat> Uh, quick, quick, uh, two quick questions, please, Ian. First, perhaps the easy one. Uh, as a non-expert in, in what you're doing, uh, 
I take it, I understand that your work does support the idea that there is a medium which we might call an ether. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, yes. Okay, the second question is the hard one. How do you plan to develop this line of research? What, what should be done next? What data do we need? Yeah, that, that, that is a hard question. That is a hard question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I had to answer it, well, I, 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 in politeness, I'll try my best. But if I had, if I were in a position of authority, and they said, "Look, you have a, a million euros here, and you, 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 you're um, head of this research department, and you know, if anything is true, work out some program to, to, uh, uh, you know, to forward this." Um, you see. Uh, we, 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 we've measured properties of the ether, but I think we've only started uh, to do that. Like, um, you know, we, we know magnetic and electric uh, properties, like the permittivity and permeability, and we know the speed of light, and we know the, um, you know, the impedance uh, of the ether. Now, I think we should go much, much further, because I, I, I always shy away from commenting on things like the density of ether, or, or, or whether it's... Um, incompressible or whether it's compressible and so on. I think we know nothing like that. And I think by doing a lot of electrical experiments, I mean, I talked about the weber kolroche experiment, a great experiment just with a simple light and jar type thing, and you can work out the speed of light. Now, I'm sure if you have an open mind, unlike the uh, traditionalist that Harry was referring to earlier, who said, look, all the textbooks are fine and we don't need to do anything about it. You could work out uh, electrical experiments, uh, which would, maybe catalog a lot of properties of the ether. And one might be able to concentrate more on, on its nature. I mean, to me, it's just really a postulate. Since we have something which has properties, I say, well, there's something there. I mean, you know, if you have a vacuum which has nothing in, well, okay, you can say there's nothingness perhaps, but no, we have. So it's a very difficult question. Um, and I think my first answer would be to shy away from trying to uh, get mechanical properties of the ether, but try to try to work on it electromagnetically. I don't know if that, that that's a satisfying answer. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for the question, Jim. Yeah. Well, uh, in regard to what Harry said, you know, he's right. Uh, they aren't going to change to uh, anytime soon to uh, uh, Hertz and type Phipps and, and now uh, Ian talked about the extra term and the, uh, the, 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 the electrical engineers in the field are not going to go for this. But it's a similar situation, it seems to me, to uh, Microsoft uh, computers versus uh, uh, Mac computers, which come from Apple. Uh, my son switched, uh, who has, has uses a computer a lot in his uh, young adult ministry work, switch to Mac because it was so much easier. But Mac is not gaining ground much against Microsoft because Microsoft is, everyone has one. I mean, uh, they don't, pe most people don't want, don't, if even though you can convince them that would be, you'd have better and easier ways to work uh, using a Mac computer, they're not prepared to jump the, the boundary between the two. They're, it's it's just too much work. It's uh, it's you know most people don't don't have time for that or energy or interest, although they may know for a fact from from a close friend that if they did go to a Mac computer, then they things would be easier for them. Their life would be easier. Their work life, and uh, so uh, I I feel that. Uh, uh, well, Harry is right. Uh, maybe we ought to take some of us, at least theorists, ought to take the trouble to go to something that's better, even though we won't be able to talk to the average engineer in the field anymore. He won't know what we're talking about. I mean, per per perhaps that is a more fundamental um, goal than arguing incess incessantly about whether it, it should be a particle model or, or, or an ether model. I mean, we did discuss this at, at a recent um, 
CNPS uh, talk. And I just said to David, uh, I said, look, I'm not prepared to enter into a quarrel with you about that. These, these, these are just different ways of looking at things. And we, we must, um, I don't really know the properties of the ether. As, as, as I say, I, I think a research program could be undertaken maybe to, to work that out. But I do know that it has certain effects and, and it has certain uh, elementary uh, measures. Uh, and therefore I just postulated, but you know, to start incessantly arguing about that is, is maybe diverting us from um, what would be the better goal. Um, as you say, Denny, following from Harry's um, slightly pessimistic uh, analysis of, of our possibility of, of, of influencing uh, the, the general workers and engineers in the area. My question, Ian, would be, can you derive the Lorentz transforms in some way from that equation, wave equation that you used, and therefore satisfy the establishment by saying your wave equation does produce the, the uh, Lorentz transform, and therefore what is the experimental evidence uh, fits into the into the theory. Have you thought about that? I, I have thought about it. Yeah, no, it, it's it's very pertinent, and uh, I I think the best I can say at present is this: that uh, what I can do, um, I have maybe one or two references, <clears throat> if necessary, I can give them to you. But uh, if um, if I uh, um, put that. Uh, modified wave equation uh, into the analysis of, of two, um, two systems, one moving you know, with velocity V relative to another in a particular direction and so on. And I try to um, transform them. In other words, to, 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 to look at what, what the transformation from one to the other would be. Um, I find that the, the, you, just, you just get the Galilean transformation. You just get the, the one time equals the other, and uh, you know x dash equals x minus vt. So, so that, that, that's the result you get out. So, in other words, you, you don't get the Lorentz transformation by doing that. You get the Lorentz transformation by omitting that term. I, that's probably. But if you include that term, you get the Galilean transformation. So, in other words, you really can't get the transformation from electric field to magnetic field and vice versa in the Galilean transformation. You can if you use the total derivative, a la Hertz. Oh, okay, right. I'm not that familiar with Hertz's uh, method, so. Yeah, there, there are a couple of ways. I, I saw a very simple way of doing it, which I've used, but there, there was a paper by an Israeli scientist, which I think I probably have somewhere. I could, I could get it for you, um, if you wish, uh, which gave a very elegant uh, description of it, actually. Um, and I think I have it somewhere in my, in, in my thing. If, if you like me, I could send that to you. Yeah, I'd be interested in seeing that because really, basically, yeah. Einstein's 1905 paper is really about how he get how to explain this. Uh, the magnetic field becomes if, if you've got a static magnetic um, a magnet or basically uh, a charge and you move it, how does that charge produce a magnetic field when it's moving but doesn't have a magnetic field when it's at rest? That's really what his paper really is yeah 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 and uh if you can't explain how the moving charge produces a magnetic field you really can't get anywhere you're stuck um and the wrench transformation allows einstein to do that the problem is his theory isn't reciprocal so you know you got this twins paradox contradiction you know but they basically ignore that problem. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Well, and anyway, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the, there's the partial way of looking at it that, that we say we don't, um, the Lorentz transformation are, are a bit of a, a, a correction. Something has been done wrong. And then you, it's almost like a, a, a golfer who, who's swinging the golf club wrong. And then, Toward, his body knows that he has to hit the ball, so he makes a correction. That's what they, they tell you. So, uh, but if you swung it correctly in the first place, you wouldn't have to make that correction. So, if if you if you start from the wrong premises, you have to make a correction, which is the Lorentz transformation. Okay, you get the you get the right result, 
but it's much easier not to do that. And um, if I can, you only get the right result for Lorentz relativity, not for Einstein relativity. Einstein relativity gives you paradoxes. Yeah, quite so. Yes, that's what Nick's been harping on for years. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. And Lorentz, when he did the original Lorentz transformations, I mean, Einstein did his derivation, but it wasn't called the Einsteinian transformation because it looked mathematically exactly like Lorentz's transformation. The difference was that for Lorentz, V was absolute, and for Einstein, it was relative velocity. But the original transformation was simply uh, built on the um, Pythagorean theorem. And that's how, you know, very simply out came the uh, clock retardation and true physical length contraction. We, and we, I think we, I think if you use the same thing with uh, the Lorentz, the original Lorentz transformation, and use velocity with respect to the predominant electromagnetic field, uh, it's a simple physics to picture and come out. For me, just as an aside, for me, the GPS data suggests that uh, the gravitational field is the ether for uh, space and time effects, not necessarily electromagnetic effects. There may be a different ether for the electromagnetic effects, namely the gravity, the electromagnetic field. I like I like um, Ian's thing about no anomaly, <laughs> just uh, analogy. analogy. Analogy, yeah. yeah. To me, if you think of um, EM like uh, kinematics, it seems to come out nice and simple. Yeah. Well, I have one other comment on a, in a different vein, and that is it seems to me that the Michelson-Gale and Michelson-Morley experiments are contradictory to each other. And you have to either pick one or the other, because if, you know, the Sagnac effect is used in GPS, which means they have to correct for the motion of the earth during the transit time from the satellite. And it seems to me that refutes relativity right there because, you know, there's no way you can claim that the speed of light is a constant because it's different based on the fact that the earth moved. So they have to put that Sagnac effect in there and Sagnac, so I, I just don't see, you know, I mean, to me, um, trying to disprove Michelson Morley is kind of, I just, you know, you have to either pick one or the other and, but you can't have both. And they seem to sort of want to have both, which doesn't work in my mind. I, I think there was an earlier, uh, Galilean electrodynamic paper co-written by Cynthia Whitney and I've forgotten as one of the famous um, collaborators with her it might have been Howard Hayden or something like that I, I think it was entitled simply if uh, Michelson Gale why not Michelson Morley you know which is basically just a shorthand way of, of, of saying that but um, for my part I think what I've done in my first paper is I've looked at the um, non- inertiality, the relative non-inertiality of, of, of both of those phenomena. And, uh, you know, the simplistic way of looking at it is to say, oh, goodness me, the the Earth in its um, revolution around the sun is going something like 30 kilometers per second, but uh, uh, the, the, the daily spin of the Earth is only something like 400 meters per second. So, you know, why is one showing up and the other isn't? But I I if you actually uh, consider and this works out very well. I mean, Nick Nick talks, I think, a lot about this. But if you consider it from from um, uh, an ECI frame, an Earth-centered inertial frame, and look at the relative uh, non-inertiality of the two motions, you'll find that um, basically the um, the spinning of the Earth is not inertial, you know. Uh, but the other one is approximately approximately inertial. It's such a large area, and it's not the instantaneous velocity which is which is important. 
so, so therefore, the results, uh, which at first hand seem baffling, that uh, the Earth, if there's an ether, the Earth is spinning through it, but yet carrying it uh, in its orbit, uh, effectively. Apart from these slight corrections I talked about earlier, the lunar and tidal locking, it seems a contradiction. But it may be, you know, it's not a contradiction when you look at the inertiality effect. And what causes these effects is another question. You could say, well, it's the gravitational field, or you could say it's the electromagnetic field, or you could say it's both. I mean, for my own part, I think I, I, I consider the gravitational field to be very important because we're, we're, we're moving, uh, you know, now at, at 18 miles per, per, per second uh, through the cosmos. Uh, unless you're, you're you're a geocentrist, and yet if I um, if I just jump uh, uh, up off, off the floor, I'm not left behind. I'm taken. I'm taken with the Earth. Um, so uh, you know. So we experience um, the Earth carrying uh, all all the phenomena and carrying gravitational mass and so on uh, in in it in, in its orbit. But but we can perceive certain effects of the spinning of the Earth. You know, in things like maybe daily weather phenomena not, not not very great but they they do they do seem to be um more um more obvious you know, that we, we can see them more and that that's anyway the provisional explanation i give for the apparent contradiction uh, but you're you're dead right that the uh, articles just look at wikipedia now it says oh the M mg experiment um it's compatible. It's, it could contradict relativity, but it's also compatible with rel relativity. Uh, yet, on the face of it, it seems to be quite contrary to it, and, and, and uh, would indicate that relative special relativity is actually false. So we have a lot of work in, uh, you know, getting more information uh, for ourselves, and, and and you know, getting nearer to the truth. But we also have have work in in trying to convince um, others, and um, uh, you know, it it it, it it's uh, it's maybe hard to do. Uh, <clears throat> I I I was quoting to some people uh, the other week. Uh, the words of Orville Wright, who said that if we are to work on the basis that what is generally believed to be true is actually true, then we shall make no progress. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 